I would like to begin by offering my most humble pranams at Bhagwan's lotus feet. Dearest Swami, respected elders, dear brothers and sisters. Whenever I have to give a talk, I notice that I pick a theme that is most relevant for me. What I need most in my life is the theme that I pick to speak also. And uh, last night when I was told suddenly that you will have to speak instead of me, I was going on thinking what I should speak about. And it's only today morning that the theme arrived, the theme of anger management. And even as the theme arrived to me, I realized that I'm most in need of this theme. And therefore, I feel all of you are side beneficiaries. I'm the main beneficiary of my own talk on anger management because I need a lot of that in my own life. So the next question you may ask is, if you yourself are in such dire need of anger management, how can you come and talk to us? There's this little story, you know, of a king who got to know that there are no sages at all or saints in his kingdom. So he called his ministers and said, is there no saint or sage in my kingdom? They said, why, O Maharaj? There are many. So then present one to me. I want to see one sage or saint. Because a kingdom without a sage or saint is not a kingdom at all. And now the minister is tensed because where does he find a sage from? So they quickly go and make a quick tour of the kingdom and they don't find. You know, avatar, sages, saints, you can't find them like how you find other things in the bazaar. There has to be a yearning, there has to be a search, there has to be seeking and it fructifies. Anyway, since they don't find anybody, they have to present somebody before the king. They go to a drama troupe and pick up an actor. And they tell, can you act as a sage? He says, yes, I can act as a sage, but I usually speak lines that are already written for me. Now, if the king asks me something, if I don't have ready-made lines, then I will get exposed. So the minister says, no problem, be a mauni sage. Be a sage who has taken on the vow of silence. So you need not answer anything that the king asks. So okay, fine. But then if the king asks, what do I do? The minister thinks for a while and says, you know what? Whatever the king may ask, just close your eyes, give a smile and with your right hand, just wave it off as if you're saying that you don't want it. No, just wave it. Whatever the king might say. So he says, okay. He says, just do this, nothing else. Just, till the king is satisfied that he has got a sage. So that a deal is struck and the, the actor is presented as a sage before the king the next day. So the king says, accept my salutations. The man smiles and waves it off. He says, wow, here is this person. The king is saluting him and he doesn't seem to be flustered at all. So it, that is how it continues, you know. The king offers food in golden dishes. The sage waves it off. He doesn't want it. The king offers whatever the king offers, this person doesn't want it. And the, doesn't speak also. The king is very happy. He says, this Mauni Baba, he's also a great renunciant. He doesn't want anything at all. And like this, days pass, weeks pass, the king is so happy. You know, he comes with the deepest problems, the sage just smiles and, you know, waves his hand as if to push it away. The king suddenly begins to feel that, yes, all problems are nothing but passing clouds. Why am I bothering so much about this? Simply by his acting, the king's life is benefited so much. At the end of a month, he salutes the sage and he says, I am grateful to you that you spent this much time with me. I will be happy if you spend all the time with me. Can you? Can you spend all your life with me? Again, the sage smiles. And you know, he moves, waves his hand as if to say, I don't need this. So the king says, yes, O Maharaj, I agree. You are the greatest renunciant. So you may leave. Naturally, the actor wanted to leave. He didn't want to be like this the whole life. That is what the minister thought. So at the end of the month, when the actor goes back, the minister goes to him with a sack of gold and he says, great, you saved all our necks. Congrats. So double the payment for you, you take it. And as he gives it 
to that say to that actor that actor smiles closes his eyes and waves it says i don't want the minister says great hey that's done you know that's done over your role is done you can take this now for the first time in a month the actor opens his mouth and he says all my life i have done crazy things for a few gold coins this one month has taught me the power of saying no and seeking none of this in the world you know i used to cry for three gold coins i was offered the entire kingdom itself when i said i don't want it so having learned the secret i don't want to go back to those cheap ways so i don't want you can keep the bag of gold this story inspires me that even though we may be just actors in the beginning if we act sincerely enough the course of acting itself will transform us swami says it says it says it beautifully if you feel you are not good at least pretend to be good start with pretending to be good as you pretend to be good you will tend to be good and then you will end being good that is what happened to this actor and it is in this spirit i feel that i want to speak about anger management because i hope that by acting as a very calm collected not at all affected by anger person in due course of time i will really become that long back you know in 1990 actually 2000 the year 2000 it was uh, when i was studying 12th standard in the higher secondary school we were the passing out batch and as was the privilege of every passing out batch we all visited bhagwan who was in brindavan at that time during our uh, final examinations just before they began for a kind of a final blessing because swami had already gone to brindavan and we would be finishing our final exams and leaving and it was not certain that everybody would be coming back to pursue higher studies in swami's institute so for many people it would be the final year so as a final blessing that class would be taken to wherever swami is and since swami was in brindavan all of us went to brindavan and it was a beautiful session there swami called us inside his residence tri brindavan and a discourse followed so many nice things in fact one of those things that swami said was two things you must always remember two things that you should always forget and uh, i think i had delivered a complete one hour lecture on this this theme itself but during that interview in the end of it swami was taking a few questions from people and i asked this very question i said swami what should we do when we get angry and swami gave four four methods he said ah yes when you get angry he immediately identified it as a very universal problem so he said first thing you do drink water he said go and drink water if you like it that way <laughs> so whatever yeah drink some cool water and uh, when he said this actually he told one after another four of them but today when i look back at each of those things that swami said i feel each of them serves a purpose when we get angry physiologically our heart rate quickens our blood pressure goes up digestive juices possibly are secreted and there's adrenaline there's so many things that happen at the physiological level and one way to definitely calm it is by drinking some cool water just drink that water and all the things are eased so in a sense the anger is appeased so first thing swami said is drink a glass of water then second thing swami said is when that doesn't work go and look at your face in the mirror it will be so contorted so distorted you will feel like smiling at yourself and i have tried this once or twice uh at least it postpones my anger definitely because when you we are angry now our face is at the ugliest possible when we smile our face is at the beautiful most beautiful possible you know that is one of the cheapest not cheapest free cosmetic we have been given we need not visit any beautician or anything a smile smile brings so much beauty on the face and anger does just the opposite and since we love ourselves so much we are the most loved for ourselves actually more than we love anybody else we love ourselves we can't stand to see ourselves ugly the minute i see myself ugly i just 
you know, try to make myself beautiful. And so when I'm angry and I look in a mirror, automatically a smile tries to come on my face. In fact, Bhagwan narrates the story of how Satyaki, Balrama and Krishna were camping in the forest in the night. And when they were camping there, they decided that since it's a forest, there might be some demons who will be attacking. So one by one they would keep guard at night. So first it was the turn of Balrama. And sure enough, there was a demon that attacks. And the story goes that Balrama fights, thrashes the demon and the demon rushes back. Balrama is also injured in the process. And when his shift ends, he wakes up Satyaki and tells, okay, now it's your turn. Demon had come, be careful, he may come again. And the demon sees that Balrama is gone, somebody else has come. Maybe this guy is weaker, I can thrash him. So tries to attack again. Satyaki is also powerful. He also overpowers the demon. He is also injured, but he succeeds. So when he wakes up Krishna, he says, hey Krishna, again it had attacked, that demon. Be careful, it may attack for the third time also. Sure enough, the demon sees that the person has changed. Okay, maybe this fellow is weak. And the demon attacks. In the morning when Krishna wakes up Balrama and Satyaki, they both ask, Oh, the demon didn't attack you. Because Krishna is clean, neat, nothing. There's no injury on his body, nothing. He says, no, no, the demon came. Then, what did you do? Because Balrama is carrying scars of the battle. Satyaki is carrying scars of the battle. And Krishna says, I just smiled. You just smiled. Yes, I just smiled. And the demon left. The story Swami has narrated many times in his discourses also. The power of a smile in calming anger. And I have realized that it's not just the opposite's anger that gets calmed. When we are angry, we ourselves try to smile. It calms our own anger. And one way to induce our own smile is to watch our face in the mirror. That is the second thing Swami said. Third thing Swami told was very interesting. He told, go to the bathroom, open the tap, and in the pitch of that falling water, in that shruti, sing a bhajan. No, open the tap and it's so tough to catch the shruti, and catch the shruti and sing a bhajan in that shruti. This is a very interesting method of channelizing the energy into something positive. You know, when we get angry, it's like a nuclear reactor within. So much of energy gets generated. And instead of using it destructively, this is one way of channelizing it constructively, I feel. This is one method possibly, opening the tap and singing in Shruti. This is what Swami said. But I think anything else, try to use it in some constructive manner. Go and try to focus, because there's a lot of energy pent up. If I can channelize and use it, that will be great. And finally, Swami said, if none of this works, go and run for two kilometers, Swami said. And he said, you'll be too tired to be angry after that. If you run two kilometers, you'll be too tired to be angry. In fact, there's one saying, when you get upset with a person, when you're angry with a person, put yourself in his shoes and run for a mile. In that way, you'll have a free pair of shoes and you'll be one kilometer away from him. <laughs> That's what they say. And this final method, no, is like, it's like doing nuclear testing on a wasteland. When we do our nuclear atomic bomb testing and all that, we do it in a wasteland where nobody is affected. So in that way, the energy is simply bombarded, but nothing is affected. That's the final method. So Swami told all these four methods when I, when I asked him, Swami, how should we control anger? Drink water, look at your face in the mirror, open the tap and sing a bhajan in that shruti, or just wear your shoes, go down and run for two kilometers. I'm reminded of another interesting anecdote narrated by Swami Paramahamsa Yogananda in his book Autobiography of a Yogi. He says that they used to meditate every day for long hours and uh, one day as he was meditating, there was this mosquito that was bothering him. I have personally noticed that when we decide to meditate, so many distractions in the world come. At my home when I'm meditating, I find that a donkey starts braying exactly at that time. A dog starts barking. I don't know whether the dog is barking when I'm meditating or I'm noticing the dog only when I'm meditating. It's barking always but I just don't notice it. I feel a twitch on my toe. I feel an itch behind my ear. I feel a sweat drop down my head. Oh my God, I become so sensitive. I'm aware of every little thing happening in my body. 
a breeze blows my hair is shaking and it's feeling ticklish there all this happens when we meditate only while it is like a distraction i was thinking that just imagine just trying to meditate itself makes us so aware of our surroundings we are so unconscious of our surroundings we don't even know what's happening on our own body we don't know when when i try to meditate i have never succeeded in meditating but even when i try to meditate i become aware of even an ant walking on my body which otherwise i might not know till it bites me so just the effort towards meditation itself raises our self awareness anyway so when parmamsa yogananda was meditating this mosquito was bothering him and i don't know why this mosquito comes and sings in our ear only <laughs> you know it can sing anywhere right it will come to the ear only and do and and he is holding it he is holding calm then the mosquito goes and settles on his thigh plunges its epidermic needle and starts sucking blood now yogananda is oh and the pain comes a body control this is no ahimsa i should not harm a creature you know is he clenches his fist he is about to lift his hand and actually swat it also but no he controls he says no no this is not this is not this is not my nature i should not do this and he is just sitting suddenly his guru calls him out calls out to him mukunda oh guru no i was meditating the mosquito bothers me it's okay now you are only disturbing my meditation mukunda so okay ha guru ji yes why are you stopping complete the action already it's done he doesn't understand the guru ji says you already killed the mosquito why are you just holding back your hand let it go ahead <laughs> he is amazed at how his guru is reading his mind and telling what's happening guru says ahimsa doesn't mean not hitting and killing the mosquito you should not even get that thought of killing the mosquito that is true ahimsa that is an eye opening statement for him and he has recorded this in his book so when i recollect this episode i feel that anger management should not just be about controlling the expression of anger by drinking water or seeing my face in the mirror or singing a bhajan or channelizing it elsewhere or by running a mile i am only preventing the expression of anger i am still getting angry oh mm. Mm. you know i am just drinking water and calming down and i am still angry and swami says every time you get angry the sadhana that you have done for 3 months the subtle nourishment that you have received from food for 3 months gets exhausted gets destroyed 3 months oh my god so while it is better than expressing anger getting angry is not the ultimate anger management i feel anger management is the ability to convert anger from its destructive nature to something constructive because it's tremendous energy how do i prevent myself from getting angry there is this little story of how a father tells his son that you know every time you get angry on someone don't express that anger here take these nails take this hammer go hammer that nail into the fence more angry you are hammer more nails you know take out your anger on the fence don't take it out on people so the son agrees so every time he gets angry he takes a few nails and goes until his anger is subsided he puts it and tap 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 he hammers it hammers it into that wooden fence and sometimes if it is less anger then with two nails his anger is gone he is very angry he needs to hit 10 nails he does this and after a month that fence is having a good 150 200 nails the father says are you still angry says, no father now i am not angry ha so when you are not angry go and remove those nails me okay so he use the other side of the hammer and keeps pulling out the nails so i again after a few hours he says dad done i have done what you said so dad says so you got angry you hit the nail your anger went you removed the nail so what is the net change there nothing dad i am back with 150 nails and my hammer he says but look at the fence 
the fence is riddled with 150 holes and those holes will never get filled and that is when the sun realizes the destructive potential of anger once it is done it can't be actually undone yeah you may pull out the nail but the hole is there and that is why parmamsa yogananda learns that lesson that it's not enough if i stop myself from swatting that mosquito that's a good beginning but that's not the end the end is that this anger doesn't rise in me at all in the same 12th standard our class teacher was dr sailesh shrivastava he is currently teaching in the institute he has written a very beautiful book in two parts swami guruji and i it's amazing amazing i have read it at least five times a very 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 inspirational teacher and many things that i have learned in life are through him so one occasion when he was speaking to us he told something that is still embedded in my mind he said see if somebody comes and slaps me i will never retaliate because my first thought will be why did swami allow this person to slap me because my swami is so powerful my swami loves me so much without his will nobody can touch me before they can touch me they'll get burned to ashes so if they are able if somebody is able to slap me then swami has allowed him to slap me so why did swami allow him to slap me what is there in it what is there i should learn so he told this in one of his talks and i was very amazed and impressed wow you know can a person even think like this because my first reaction is you know they say that mahatma gandhi says if somebody slaps you on one cheek show the other cheek for me uh, for me whenever somebody slaps me on one cheek i feel like slapping back on both their cheeks you you know give it back with a double bonus you know i can't follow what mahatma gandhi has told but here sailesar was telling that when somebody slaps me on one cheek i will think why is he slapping me what is the reason behind and when we were students we often used to think that sailesar thinks too much about everything and at that time this is what i thought oh god he is thinking too much about this also what is there so much to think about a slap somebody slapped you you slap him back then ask what happened why did you slap we can discuss that but today as i look back that attitude defines a great kind of faith and surrender to swami faith in swami and surrender to swami the faith that the lord is completely in charge of my life nobody can touch me without his will and if somebody is touching me it is his will there is a rest, there is a reason for me this slap is a messenger from god carrying a message that is how he took and it's amazing how even to this day everything that happens to him in his life he always looks at it as a messenger from god bringing a message in the ancient times you know a king would communicate to another king via a messenger because there was no fast method of communication there was no motorized vehicle there was no telephone there was no satellite communication nothing the fastest way was for a rider to carry a message on a horse and go to the other person horse or a chariot they used pigeons but pigeons were not guaranteed they were possibly like postal services here the uh, messenger on the horse was like the courier you are guaranteed at least that it will be delivered so when the messenger goes he can tell anything the king can tell to another king that you are a cowardly idiot you surrender or else i will make you lick the dust so the messenger will go and read it out oh you king you are a cowardly cowardly idiot if you don't lick the dust of my feet i will make you bite the dust now the king will get angry naturally but he is not supposed to do anything to the messenger because he is only the messenger he has got nothing to do with the message but often times it would happen if the messenger brings bad news the king would behead him that's why messengers would get scared to carry bad news but everybody want to take the good news because the king gets happy immediately removes a necklace from his neck and gives it there's nothing great about the messenger there's nothing wrong in the messenger he is just a messenger a wise king will know that a wise king will know that this messenger is just bringing a message if i receive that message this messenger will go away 
to be able to look at everything that we get in life as a messenger is an amazing attitude including people or things that make us angry so i am speaking in context of anger management that's why i am taking anger but i am sure it applies equally for jealousy envy sadness frustration irritation everything but when something or someone makes me angry going by what sailesh sir said it would be amazing to think of it as a messenger that has come from god with this message what is the message once i decode the messenger will go away again i am reminded of an episode that happened in the same year when i was studying in 12th standard and again it was the inspiration from sailesh sir that's why i am possibly remembering it recollecting it what had happened was i had got caught in some indiscipline issue the discipline levels are very high in the hostel i'm not telling it as an excuse i'm just saying the fact and i had got caught in some indiscipline because of which i had been barred from participating in sports and games and cultural activities for the year that was okay for me that was an okay punishment for me i took it in my stride but then came a punishment which i could not bear which was i had this camera with which i would take swami's photos in the mandir and for getting the camera to the mandir one had to get a permission slip from the warden so out of him being upset with me or whatever he stopped giving me this permission uh, this camera slip to carry the camera to the mandir so i am left high and dry and you know for me the camera was an instrument with which i would try to get close to swami because i'll be taking photographs and once or twice swami would notice me because of the camera so i felt camera is not just my hobby or just something i do for fun it is possibly my instrument that takes me closer to god this for a musician his musical instrument becomes an instrument spiritual instrument to take him closer to god i felt the same about my camera and i got angry i was very upset with the warden i was very angry with the warden and when i received the advice that you should not be angry you should control anger i said why should i he is getting angry on me he is not giving me the slip because he is angry this is very uh, unfair it has got no connection with uh, me taking camera to mandir you know my indiscipline was not related to the mandir uh, these were all my thoughts so it was going on and months passed guru purnima the festival of guru purnima i couldn't these major festivals are the days when you would love to get the camera because swami would come and sit in the center of the stage and it would be very nice so many different things before 2007 it was not regular that swami will come and sit outside swami would finish darshan rounds go in and there would be interviews and swami will come out only during bhajans maybe but on festival day swami will come and sit outside for the whole time so as a photographer these are the times when you look forward to because you have got one hour with your subject so you can you have got a greater chance of getting nice photographs swami smiling swami blessing abhayasta all this and on festival days greater probability of swami raising both his hands so you would look forward to taking camera on the festival days this is the year 2000 i'm speak uh, 1999 2000 i'm speaking about so when i was not getting permission slips even for these major festivals i was really really feeling down that was when i happened to hear another talk where sailesh sir was talking he was our class teacher he was talking to all of us 12th and students and you know he began to talk of his own life story all of us know that sailesh sir is brilliant in his subject he's a brilliant physicist he is also brilliant as a musician many of the beautiful compositions that we see that we sing in front of swami today you know he has been involved in the composition of all those songs almost all the convocation drama songs almost all of them he has been the composer many christmas carols many stotrams he has composed silently in the background a great phenomenal musician the amazing thing is he has not received any formal training in music but such a person for whom i thought his entire life must be music and physics because he is a genius in both of them when he was speaking that day he suddenly made a statement and he said we should never forget why we have come here to prashanti nilayam to puttaparthi to swami 
we have come here for swami and so i may think that i am a physicist i may think that i am a musician that i am a very good uh, player of the harmonium but it is not for physics or for the music that i came here i came here for swami so if my physics or music gets in my way of me reaching swami then i will give it up because they don't matter for me what matters is swami he just made the statement and again it left an indelible impression in my mind i said wow you know this is something closest to his heart because he is also very good at it but he is saying that if i need to give it up i will give it up i was very impressed and days passed i was still not able to take my camera to the mandir then came ganesh chaturthi and ganesh chaturthi ganesh is one of my favorite gods also because ganesh is considered as vigna harta vigna harta the one who removes all obstacles and i thought oh ganesh there is one big obstacle sitting in my way remove that one obstacle please i want to take camera to the mandir i want to shoot swami's photographs i'm not being allowed as i said i'm fine with the other punishment i'm not allowed to participate this year in any of the sports and cultural events that's okay ganesh but this is too much please so i was looking forward to ganesha doing something on my behalf and helping me helping clear the situation at that time i did not know but today what i know is again bhagwan has mentioned this in his discourse that the elephant is a very very unique and interesting animal when it walks in the jungle it makes a path wherever it goes it doesn't need a path the elephant doesn't need a path because it makes its path wherever it walks the trees fall and a path is created and swami said ganesha is like that that's why we call him vigna harta no obstacles can ever stand in his way but swami says but when you're going through bandipur or any any other forest region if an elephant comes and stands on the road even though there is a path you can't go you have to wait and you better not honk or do anything funny because the elephant can come just pick up your car and throw it to the side and this is real life this is real life experience of people who have traveled through bandipur or through many of the african reserves game reserves if an elephant is blocking your path you can only be patient and wait that's it if the elephant is there for one hour wait for one hour if it is there for five hours wait for five hours okay otherwise you will be hastening your journey to the other world possibly so patience is recommended and swami said vinayaka is not just vigna harta he is also vigna karta and that is when we realize that yes these are both the names of ganesha they call him vigna harta also they call him vigna karta also why vigna karta swami says if the path you have chosen is wrong even though if it is easy if it is wrong ganesha will come and stand as an obstacle so ganesha is vigna harta and vigna karta when the path you are choosing is right even if there is no path he will make a path for you if the path you have chosen is wrong then even though there is an easy path he, he will himself come and block so i was praying to ganesha not realizing that possibly ganesha himself is blocking because there is possibly a message for me to learn from this whole experience this is what i realized that once we learn the message the messenger goes away that night you know so ganesh chaturthi festival again came and i could not take camera to the mandir now after ganesh chaturthi 3 days later usually there is the immersion ceremony where all the ganesha idols are taken in procession and immersed in a lake bed or in a well and again the symbolism of this whole event is very beautiful swami says that you are the eternal atma you get embodied into a body which is made of the five elements just like the idol of ganesha made of clay mrinmayi it is swami says the chinmayi enters the mrinmayi mrinmayi is mud and chinmayi is the eternal swami says don't think that this is you don't think this is ganesha it is just a representation of ganesha because one day the mud will become one with the mud but ganesha is there forever so also one day your body will become one with the mud but you are there forever the chinmayi enters the mrinmayi the mrinmayi goes the chinmayi remains that is the symbolism of why ganesha is brought celebrated and with great fanfare and then with great fanfare you know it 
uh, for an outsider if we think about it it will look very strange you are going there to drown the lord and you are celebrating and dancing you put him into the water and dance in joy birth has to be celebrated death has to be celebrated because as bhagwan krishna tells in the bhagavad gita the atma never is born nor does it die is neither born nor does it die so anyway the immersion ceremony were, would be a very beautiful and memorable thing for all the students because we would all make different chariots and palanquins and we will take lord ganesha in a uh, procession to the mandir and swami would come and break coconuts in front of each chariot and palanquin and many times he would pose for photographs with those students who are carrying the palanquin or dragging the chariot and after those photographs the chariot would again go back in procession and the ganeshas would be taken for immersion so this was the custom and this is the tradition it is still followed to this day every ganesh chaturthi two days three days later all the ganeshas are brought in procession to the mandir now it was a great uh, honor or privilege to be part of this chariot making or palanquin making team because if swami is in a good mood you will get a group photo with swami on that day so not everyone will get selected so those who are skillful in arts who can paint who cut it's a chance for them apart from that every class you know there will be a few boys who will be reg regularly doing pujas when the ganesha is there at home or when we bring ganesha to the hostel there are multiple ganesha each classes each class has its own ganesha so it is believed that ganesha has come home and you have to treat ganesha like a guest at home so be given breakfast in the morning you know lunch dinner and uh, put to sleep and woken up all this has to be done ritualistically so every class would have its own pujaris two three students who would get up early morning do the pujas and they will distribute prasadam to the rest of the class even to this day the tradition continues so these pujaris for those three four days of sadhana that they have done they'll also be allowed so they will wear a orange um, veshti and they will wear this and like that vedic dress they will wear and they will also go in the procession and when they do the puja there will be some students who will be doing bhajans from that class so they also have to get up early get ready and do all this so they will also go so every chariot will have its bhajan group its vedam group and its chariot makers the chariot makers will be spending day and night making chariots and these people will be there so about 30% of the class will go with the chariot so they get a chance so other 70% can't because everybody goes you can't get a group photo with swami there so everybody tries to get into this 30% and i was not skillful at any arts but i did my bhajan and all that but i was sure but anyway i won't get a chance because of my indiscipline issues which is seeming to bother every aspect of my life and that is another thing i realized you know we may think that i am disciplined in everything only in one aspect i am indisciplined but it seeps through there's a leakage there's a seepage in a ship if there's one hole also it's enough it'll sink the whole ship in discipline also one hole is enough it will seep into other things and simply affect everything so i'm still again that's another thing i'm struggling with discipline in life just like anger in life but that is what i realized that discipline has to be complete so it seemed to be seeping into everything so i had no hope of uh, you know accompanying the chariot or anything but anyway i used to go do the pujas i was not a pujari but i would do the bhajans and i would wake up early everything i was doing that is when as i said this talk from silas sir about him not being attached to his physics or music that is what he delivered and when i heard that i suddenly felt that i understood why ganesha was sitting in my path so that night i stood before bhagwan's photograph and i said swami i have also come here only for you swami i have not come here to play games or do cultural activities or take photographs or any of this and if you feel that they are taking me away from you then i don't want that i don't want that i want you swami i want you i have come here only for you i stood there making this prayer and like magic there was a knock on the door and somebody said brother warden is calling you i said okay so there are six of us in each room so he called me so i went i go to the warden's office and to my pleasant shock he gives me a camera slip and he says only today you can take to mandir okay again from tomorrow onwards you can't take so i was like wow okay fine but, but why i you know i wanted to ask him so why are you giving me 
but I didn't want to, you know, sabotage my chances. I simply picked the cheat and came out and said, wow, wow, the messenger goes away pretty fast, huh? pretty fast. Just now I'm telling over there in the room and already the messenger is gone. Wow, you know, I carried that, that pink, it's a pink color slip. I don't know, it's a coincidence, but yeah, it was like a pink slip. So I was carrying that and I was walking to my room. Even before I could enter the room, another brother comes there and he says, Brother Silester is calling you. Okay. So I went to Silester's room now. And Silester says, So, you're going with the chariot? He asked me. I said, No, sir, I would love to, but I'm not going. No, every day you've been doing bhajans. Take. So there will be the special yellow jacket like Gopala's everybody will wear. There will be only some 24 jackets. Only those 24 guys can go from each class. So he gives me one yellow jacket and he says, hmm, you take and go. Wow! <laughs> In a span of five minutes, I am taking my camera and going with the chariot for immersion to Mandir. I was thrilled. Went to the Mandir. Swami came and gave group photos. So I got a chance to get a photograph with Swami. It didn't end there. Because after the group, after my group got the photo, when Swami went to the next chariot, I went ahead with my camera and began to take photos of each chariot with Swami. So I took multiple photographs and as I was sitting there, Swami completed everything. He was coming and walking back to the center of the dais and as he is walking back, he takes a handkerchief from somebody there and begins to wipe his face, wipe his hands because there is a lot of uh, coconut water everywhere. He has burst, he has broken so many coconuts that that water has sprinkled all over his face, hair, hand. He must have broken at least 30 to 40 coconuts. So he is wiping it and as he is wiping it, he comes and stands in the center to look at all the chariots, the array of chariots that are before him and coincidentally it happens to be one foot away from me. So I am kneeling down with my camera to the side, one foot ahead of me with his back turned to me Swami standing there, handkerchief in hand, standing and gently swaying to the rhythm of the bhajan going on and looking at all the chariots that have assembled in front of him. And I was feeling so happy because I never imagined that on the Ganesha immersion day, I would be sitting so close to Swami. So sitting behind, I said, Swami, Swami, I am sure Swami can hear me, okay? <laughs> but Swami is just not responding, he is standing there and swaying. So I said, Swami, I know clearly that you can hear me. I know surely you can hear me. But you are acting as if you are listening to the bhajan. But it's okay, Swami. You act like this only. I just want to tell you that I love you, Swami. And as long as you are within my earshot, I will continue telling that a hundred times. Swami, I love you, Swami. Swami, I love you, Swami. Swami, I love you, Swami. I kept telling that, you know. <laughs> because I am sure that he can hear it. I kept telling it, I, I might have told it a dozen times possibly. I said, Swami, I love you, Swami. I know you can listen. Thank you, Swami. I love you, Swami. Thank you, Swami. I was feeling wonderful, you know. Because I realized that once you learn the message, you know, in a matter of seconds, everything changes off. So fast it changes off. It's just like that messenger who comes to the king's court. However bitter the message, it's not the messenger's fault. He's just bringing a message. You receive the message and the messenger will leave. And even, even as I said this, Swami stood there for possibly a minute. Suddenly he turned around, flashed such a beautiful smile and that handkerchief that was in his hand, he threw it at my face and told, keep it. And he walked and went in. I still have that handkerchief with me. You know, it felt so beautiful, so wonderful. And I knew that Swami heard. That was his way of acknowledging. Possibly, you know, he can't stand there and if I tell Swami, I love you, Swami. Then, yeah, I love you too. I love you, Swami. Yeah, yeah, I love you too. He can't do that. But in his own sweet manner, he waited for the whole thing to get over, turned around, smiled, threw the handkerchief and walked in. And believe it or not, the Ganesha immersion event which I thought, thought would be the worst possible one in my life is till date the best one in my life. And today when I look back at this episode, I feel all this happened simply because I was able to receive the message. Once the message is received, the messenger goes away. And, and I have experienced this off and on many times. You know, three years back we had been to this Kollur Mukambika temple which is supposed to be a Shakti Pita and very famous and it's somewhere in coastal Karnataka. And uh, somehow, you know, this kind of uh, love for Swami and faith in Swami, sometimes I allow it to go to my head and become a little arrogant. 
you know my wife said let's go to kollur mukamika temple i said why we should go we have got swami here means when swami is there why to go to any other temple i had like these reservations even against tirupati and i have given a talk on that also how how i my ego was powdered and crushed and i was humbled basically it comes to the truth that every form of divinity is the same god when i insult one god i am insulting my same swami in fact swami goes a level forward there is a um, stanza which says sarva deva namaskaram keshavam prati gachati which means the salutation that you offer to any god goes to keshava sarva deva tiraskaram keshavam prati gachati the criticism that you offer to any god also goes to keshava keshava or because possibly for the person who wrote this stanza his beloved was keshava or krishna swami in his discourse modified it and said sarva jeeva namaskaram keshavam prati gachati sarva jeeva tiraskaram keshavam prati gachati meaning the praise and criticism of every jeeva every being goes to your lord not just to different gods so as i said at that time when my wife said let's go to this kollur mukambika temple mukambika temple very powerful deity i said why we should go to all the other gods yeah we have got swami no need i am not interested she said no but i want to go I said, okay for your sake let's go if it is interesting i will admire the architecture i will see all this it's nice you know this was my kind of thought so i went there and i took a few photographs the architecture was nice everything was good my parents were also there with me and uh, as we were going into the temple i suddenly realized you know we were at a beach resort so we would often be playing on the beach so i had worn three fourths uh, not shorts not a pant but three fourths and there at the temple suddenly they said no no sir you can't come inside with three fourths you be out oh my god so i said no but uh, can i you know my wife everyone is going in no no sir you are and our resort was at least 80 kilometers away we had traveled all this way here and i was not being allowed to enter inside and oh my god i did not know so i walked out and said my mother went in my father went in my wife went in and my in-laws had also come they also went in only i was not allowed in and as i sat outside it hit me you know i had said why we should go to mukambika why we got swami no why we should go no need so the mother was saying so you don't want to come don't i don't want to force you no they all want to come let them come you sit out only admire the architecture of the temple we would be so careful with our thoughts because there is a merciful being up there blessing each of our thoughts so when we think negative thoughts we are harming our own self that's why possibly they tell us to think positive thoughts so as i realized this immediately i went into the apology mode i said amma sorry amma mukambika sorry i would love to have darshan of your beautiful form please but i know i made a mistake so again next time if possible i'll definitely come but i'll come with humility amma i promise but you know as i said the lord is so loving even as i complete this prayer another priest comes and taps me and says not going inside why i showed i said see he gives me one red dhoti he says you wear this dhoti on that then you can go in now i said okay how much should i pay hey for darshan you pay and all over no no you go in and come and give it back i'll wait here to priest you know first of all i thought these priests are all money minded people they'll give you a banana and ask you for money here he is giving me a red silk dhoti and not asking for money you know i was simply stunned i said okay so he gave me and he waited that's what happened i went in finally i went in and joined my parents so my father saw and said wow you know for devi red is a favorite color how did you get red dhoti i said ha nah, devi only gave because i told her i'm sorry she only sent this to me and i could have darshan i came out that priest was still there i handed him back with thanks he refused to take anything else i thanked him i said you know i feel like you are you are a representative of devi only who has come and give he said ha ah, no no you have nobody should go without having amma's darshan he took the dhoti and he went and i had my darshan and again you know like this many times i can go on narrating but the point i'm trying to make is can we look at every situation that makes us angry or upset as a messenger that has come with a message the moment we learn that message the messenger will simply vanish if we are able to do that i feel we would have moved one level higher in anger management the first level is controlling the expression of anger the second level is trying to understand anger and not allowing anger to arise because i look at it as a message to me from my god from the universe from that divine from that supreme whatever 
from nature. I look at it as a messenger from nature. So I don't get angry at all. Finally, once we are able to do this, I feel the pinnacle of anger management is what we see in Swami's life. Can I use anger as a tool? See, first when I control anger, I'm still getting angry. If I decide not to get angry, then anger doesn't touch me at all. Then I'm possibly missing out on some of the advantages that I can get by using anger. Because we have seen Swami use anger. Anger is useful in correcting people. Anger is useful in making a point. Anger is useful in driving home a lesson. It is there. I have a one and a half year old daughter and I see how mock anger works. I just had to knit my eyebrows and say, Hey Bhakti! And she suddenly understands that no, no, she can't get away. But you know what? Really, I'm not having anger in my heart. I know just I have to play, play act. And when I do that, I wonder why can't I do this with everybody else also? Why can't I just use the anger as a tool? That's all. And I've seen Swami do this. You know, I've seen Swami rip apart a person. Scolding. So much so that, you know, sometimes saliva comes flying out of his mouth and falls on the face. That angrily he's scolding. The next moment, the next moment he turns to another person on his right or left and speaks with great love and compassion. Not a trace of anger in the voice. I feel that's a miracle. That's a miracle. Any of us can try it when we are angry. Anybody who comes into our path gets it. Not just the person on whom we are angry. When I'm really angry, when I'm upset, anybody, be it my wife, my child, my parents, my friend, anybody, they come and uh, there will be some anger that will leak on them. Because I am not acting out anger. I am angry. I have allowed the animal in me to get the better of me. But it was not like that for Swami. For Swami, anger was a tool. Just as attachment was a tool. Swami would say, Students, I can't live without you. You think he can't live without us? You think he's attached? You think he's like you and me? Getting attached and saying, I can't live without you? No. Attachment also is a tool there. It is necessary to impart some lesson then I will use attachment. It is necessary to impart this lesson, I will use anger. Swami neither got angry nor got attached. He's beyond all this. He's beyond all this. But we see Swami crying, we see Swami getting angry. But as I said, if we notice, we will also see that he's in the same five minutes, he has cried, he has got angry, he has smiled, he has done everything. How is that possible? That's because he uses emotions like the masks that great actors use on stage. An actor may come on stage and say, I am going to kill you and drink your blood. And the director says, great shot, cut. And he'll go and have coffee with that same guy. Are you said you're going to kill him and drink his blood? Hey, you're drinking coffee with him? Yeah, yeah, I have nothing against him. You have nothing against him? Yeah, nothing. Then my role demanded it, so I told that, that's all. Who goes on the knees with trembling hand, offers a flower and says, be mine forever. I can't think of sleeping without you. I can't think of eating without you. There's no life without you. Cut. She goes her way, he goes his way. Hey, what happened? You're not going to go with her? You said there's no life without her? No, no, that's my role. That's all. I just did my role. But it was so real. Yeah, yeah, I do my role very seriously. I take my role seriously and do it. But I'm not involved in my role. I know it's just a role. Whether I'm a father, a brother, a husband, a whatever, a son, a mother, a sister, a daughter, I have to remember that it's my role. I have to do my role. I can't tell... You are not my child. All are one. All are divine. Go. No, 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 no. Then the drama will become a flop. Yeah, you are my child in the drama. So like an actor, I will give, I will do everything. And for anybody viewing is as real as real can be. It is a loving mother and a loving child. That's it. But deep within, I know that you are not my child. I am not your mother. You are an actor. I am an actor. That is that ekatma bhava. When we realize that all are one actually. And Swami saw it like that. We used to call Swami as, we still, we call Swami as love walking on two feet. And Swami would call us Prema Swarupalara, embodiments of love. I mean, Swami, you are calling me embodiment of love, you have no idea, Swami, what I am. No, no, you are embodiment of love. But Swami, you don't know. I have jealousy, I have envy, I have, I have selfishness, I am angry. No, no, that's all the role you are doing. Swami can see beyond the role. And therefore, when you get selfish in your role, I will get angry in my role. <laughs> when you are selfless in your role, I will smile and shower love in my role. But neither am I attached to you, 
nor am I angry on you because you are also an actor, I am also an actor. That's all. We are acting the role. You have forgotten that you are an actor, you think you are the role. I remember that I am the actor. That's what Swami would say. When people would ask, are you divine? He says, yes, I am divine. But if you realize, you will also know that you are also divine. Only difference between you and me is that I know it, you don't know it. That's all. I know that I am an actor, you think you are the role. In fact, we had done this once in Bhagwan's presence, you know, we were uh, doing a little skit in which the son is leaving the father and going off to America and the father is crying and telling, don't go, don't go my son, don't go my son. And at the end of that, the director says, oh cut, done, the role is done, great, great acting. He goes, what acting? Uh, my son is going. He says, yeah, 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 done, done, yeah, it's superb. What done? He's gone. I can't now think. Mr. Verma, cool down. You know, it's over. No, it's not. And Swami was laughing when he was seeing this. All of us were laughing. After which, you know, we, we just were trying to share the message that this is what we do in life. We forget that we are enacting a role. So we take our attachments very seriously. We take our hatred very seriously. We have love and hate in the world. Because we forget that we are playing a role. So I feel the ultimate in anger management will come when we are able to see the oneness of the totality of this whole creation that God pervades everything. Then, like Swami, I will be able to use my anger also as a tool, that's all. I feel that is the pinnacle of anger management where we move from controlling the expression of anger to controlling anger to finally using that anger as a tool. You know, I feel this is the journey from abusing to using. Can we move from abusing I, I tell myself this, you know, because my name is Arvind Balsubramanya AB. I tell Arvind, can you move from abusing to AB using? Can AB start using anger from abusing? Possibly in conclusion, I will just recollect what happened in the court of Yudhishthira when there was a discussion going on as to who should receive the first libations first salutation, first prostrations before the yagna, everybody suggested it should be Lord Krishna. At that time, Shishupala says, why, why Krishna? There are so many elders. If you want, if you want somebody of respect, pick Krishna's father. He's so senior. If you want, if you look at Krishna as a teacher, then Drona is there. Pick Drona. Why are you picking Krishna? If you're looking at Krishna as a dear friend, don't you have other dear friends? If you're looking at him as a benefactor, then Drupada, your own father-in-law, look at him. Why are you picking Krishna? And then he starts giving abuses to Krishna. Krishna is that, Krishna is this, he's a wretched cowherd, what does he know? He's a cunning guy, he's not even a king, he's not even this, and goes on and... And different people react to it in different way. Yudhishthira is ever calm. He says, oh, Shishupala, oh, my dear one, don't, don't. See, everybody, all seniors are accepting him. Why are you creating so much problem? Be calm. And Bhishma, he's upset, but he's very firm. He says, I am the senior most and I have no problem with Krishna. So I don't see why any junior should wag his tongue. All juniors should just sit, shut and sit. That's how Bhishma says. Bhima says, I'm going to rip apart that fellow. I'll kill him. Who is that fellow? Come here, I'll kill that fellow. Who's talking like that against Krishna? So, whenever this criticism happens, when somebody criticizes us, our reaction is also somewhere in this spectrum. Like that only when somebody criticizes our God, if somebody criticizes Swami also, our reaction is somewhere in this spectrum. But it is interesting to see what is Krishna's reaction. Isn't that the ideal reaction that we should follow? Instead of following Bhishma or Bhima or Arjuna, let's follow Krishna. What is Krishna's reaction? He is sitting silently. And why is Krishna sitting silently? Because... Krishna is not only present in the present, he also knows the past and the future. That is why God's reaction and response is totally different from our reaction and response. Because God knows the past, he knows the future. We know only the present. That too, partially as much as our senses can comprehend, that's all. Even present, I don't know comprehensively. So because Krishna knows everything, he's sitting calm. I feel that's why we should look at Krishna and do what Krishna does. Ah, he knows. He is telling me to do this, I'll do this, that's all. I may not understand because I don't know the past and future. Krishna knows the past. Shishupala was born with multiple hands and legs and he was braying like a donkey. And a celestial voice was heard that in whose hands he will become normal, he will be the killer of the sun. He will be the killer of Shishupala. 
And when Shishupala as a baby is put in Krishna's lap, his arms drop off, his third eye disappears and he begins crying like a baby instead of bringing like a donkey. The mother realized that Krishna is going to be the killer of the son. So she goes to Krishna and tells, Krishna, if my son offends you, please forgive him. And Krishna says, not once, not twice, a hundred times I will forgive him. Hundred times I will forgive him. And Shishupala knows this. So he keeps a count. Hundred times I can insult Krishna, nothing he can do to me. This, you know, man always thinks he's smart. He doesn't realize that God is smarter because man is a crea- God is the creator of man. So he goes on, keeps a count and keeps telling. Exactly at 100 he stops. <laughs> Krishna, what you'll do now? I've stopped at 100. But you know the master plan, the way it works, Bhishma at that point in time says, I think now Shishupala will shut up. Because even him criticizing Krishna is Krishna's will. Krishna willed that he should criticize, so he criticized. Now Krishna has willed that he should shut up, so he will shut up. <laughs> Shishupala is not able to bear this. What the hell you think Krishna? Krishna is what? Why you criticize him for the 101st time? Krishna picks up a plate with a smile and throws it. No anger on his face. And this plate transforms into the Sudarshana Chakra, goes and chops the neck of Shishupala. The story does not end there. A light, the soul of Shishupala emerges. Krishna walks with a smile, accepts the soul into himself. And everybody is shocked. Krishna, you, this is the ultimate destination, ultimate destiny of every soul. Every soul is going to come to me. So it doesn't matter whether you reach me by criticizing me or by loving me, it doesn't matter. Because that is, if we read, this is what we come across, that Shishupala merged into Krishna. The same we will see whether it's Ravana, Kamsa, everybody. There is no distinction between a devotee and critic. So why I should be a devotee then? Simply because a devotee's life is more peaceful, I feel that's all. You know, Shishupala merged in the God, merged in Lord, but throughout his life he was always cringing and crying and he was bitter. People may say, no, no, Pandava suffered, Duryodhana was happy. No, no, Pandavas appeared to suffer. Yeah, they were in the forest, they didn't have proper clothes, they didn't have, but they were happy always. Duryodhana was in the palace, but he was unhappy always. He was jealous of the Pandavas who had just clothes with them. That's why he would keep sending battalions and battalions to the forest. If we read the Mahabharata, we'll see this. Anybody who has read the Mahabharata will never say that Duryodhana was happy and Pandava suffered. Pandavas were very happy, whether they were in the forest or in the kingdom. That is what happens when we get God. And when you leave God, whether you are in the forest or kingdom, you are not happy. Because happiness does not lie in the forest, happiness does not lie in the kingdom. Happiness, happiness lies in the union with God. So on that note, I feel I will conclude this talk on anger management. I hope, as I said, that I learn from this talk because there's a lot for me to learn in this field. I hope that I move from controlling anger, I mean controlling the expression of anger to controlling anger to finally using anger, the journey from abusing to using. Thank you Swami for this wonderful opportunity. Jai Sairam.